Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. And welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. I'm Michelle Miao, host of the Michelle Miao Show and also a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Our thanks to the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Food Lit event. It's my pleasure to introduce to you all Kwame Onwachi, who's the uh, James Beard award-winning chef and author of My America, Recipes from a Young Black Chef. Many of you may recognize Chef Onwachi as a former contestant and recurring judge on Top Chef. He is also an executive producer for Food and Wine magazine. He trained at the Culinary Institute of America and opened five restaurants all before turning 30. My America is his first cookbook and is a true celebration of the food of the African diaspora as handed down through Chef Onwachi's own family history. Throughout the book, he shares personal stories that highlights the deep connections between food and place and food and culture. We will be, we'll, we'll be discussing a whole lot in the next hour. So I want to remind you all that if you have a question for Chef Onwachi, please text that through the chat box on YouTube. Chef Onwachi, welcome and congratulations on publishing your first cookbook. Let Thanks. me start by saying, um, congrat I mean, yes, congratulations, but I, it was very hard for me to get through the whole cookbook, I, I was very hungry, um, <laughs> which I think a lot of people get. Um, what's interesting to me, though, is that you've already written a memoir, and I don't know if it's traditional that people write memoirs and then their first cookbook. Uh, so tell us, you know, kind of what the experience was like by sharing your entire story and then sharing, you know, these recipes that are so deeply personal to you. Yeah, well, you know, in true Kwame fashion, I like to do things a little differently and it may be harder, um, but I think it's important to get to know somebody and get to know their story. You know, most artists or, 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 or anyone that you really resonate with it's because you know their story. So like, that's why it was, it was important for me to do that first. And then the cookbook, I think it's every chef's dream to have a cookbook, you know? Um, so when I got that opportunity, I was thrilled and, and put my all into it. And, and I wanted to show what my America was like. Yeah, I love that, that you talked about it being your America. You know, sometimes like we go out there, we talk about America, especially like with food, as if it's in this general sense, like, it, you know, that there um, is a traditional item like hot dogs, hamburgers. I mean, you're right. Yes, that's probably somebody's America, but it's not yours. And we all have so many different uh, stories. Talk to us about, you know, the fact that you did travel back to some of the places that you, like, for example, you went back to Nigeria, where you had actually lived for a couple years and um, really got, I guess, reacquainted, right, with the food that uh, was nostalgic to you. It was important for me, you know, really, like, if I'm going to be documenting this and, and putting this on this platform that I need to go back and connect and touch the soil and walk the roads you know my 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 ancestors have walked um, and it was a way to to reconnect and and really have this like direct pipeline to flavor uh, this direct pipeline to culture and to learn about these dishes in, in the places where they were created yeah um I wanted to actually uh, note that you do start the book off or before you even get to the recipes you start with the pantry mm -hmm. and you know that's usually where lots of people are going to make a meal you know start but the thing is there's so much more to your pantry than a whole lot of I guess everybody else's pantries let's yeah, let's start with that and mayo it's um so the pantry is so important for this book but I think in in really great cooking in general you know you start by by building way before you touch a piece of protein or you're, you're lighting fire to, to make a meal. You're, you're, you have to start with the building blocks. Um, and the pantry has been so important in, in Africa and in the Caribbean and even the American South because it was an act of preservation. You know, we, you had to build those things. Um, and it, 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 it helps one by preserving those ingredients, obviously, but also it cuts cooking time down substantially. You know, if you're starting a, a recipe and you have to make all of these things, um, it'll it'll take a while to, to complete that recipe. And with all of like the hours that we work, you know, even now, but more so back in the day, 
you know, we didn't have that time. So that was, that was a luxury. Um, so that's why that pantry is so important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you shared a whole lot, obviously, in your memoir. Lots of people, especially when you're doing like talks and interviews, they'll always bring up the fact that you've shared like, uh, the challenges you had growing up, right? Um, from, mm -hmm. you know, getting jumped into a gang to dealing drugs to then, you know, finding yourself and your voice and then doing all the stuff that I even mentioned in the intro, opening five restaurants before uh, 30 and now with this first cookbook, do you feel like you have accomplished a lot enough or mm -hmm. there's a whole lot more? There's so much more, there's so much more life to live. Um, we only get one of these things. So that's why I like to just do so many, so many different things because it's so precious. It's, it's a, it's a gift. And I, I want to do, I want to do, I want to blow what I've done in the past out the water. You know, I, I think that there's, there's a long runway for me to continue to do things and push the narrative. Push yeah. The you, yeah. You'd once said though, that America might not be ready for a young black chef. And I wonder if like that opinion has changed, um, especially now with people seeing your recipes, knowing your family stories through your recipes and being able to taste it in their own homes? Well, they better get ready because it's coming regardless, you know. Um, I think for me, like my next steps or just, just within everything I do, I try to be extremely intentional, you know, and even this book was, was very intentional to give a voice, a voice to the inaudible. Um, so many people have their different experiences of growing up in America. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, brown, or, or, or whatever. It's um, whatever happens in your home is your version of, of America. Because when you're a kid and you're eating food, you're not asking like, what nationality is this dish, mom? Like you're just eating it. And you think that's how everyone else eats until you leave your, your, your nest. And you see people have, you know, they have different cultures and different rituals. So, um, so yeah, everyone has their version of, of their America. Yeah. One one of the things that was striking for me, you know, just it's not just a cookbook. It's so ah. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's so um so much meaning to it, and I really did feel like I was getting to know your entire family, but also the ancestral history, and you know something like rice. In my culture, rice is super spiritual. It's religious, but I never actually was able to articulate that right to like people in fact I've got sticky rice cooking later for um, mm -hmm. dinner and you had this great way of talking about rice and its connection to your own ancestral history but also the history of of you know here in America let's talk about you know what you wrote you said so much of diaspora cuisine not just from the American South but from the Caribbean too as well as African cuisine itself has been influenced by the slave trade such as rice Let's get into that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, rice, it's, it's bittersweet. You know, um, a lot of slaves were, were, were taken because of their knowledge of how to grow rice. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a huge cash crop in America and they really couldn't figure out how to do it right. So they brought the people over that did. And with them came, you know, that came their culture, you know, came their practices, but it also their food ways. So rice, there's like... And that's why I also say like, you can't talk about American food without talking about West African food, because all those ingredients that came over here from watermelon to rice, to okra, to bene seeds, uh, you know, to collard greens, all of those things are now considered ubiquitous with American food. But those are, those have West African origins and, you know, rice being one of the big ones. Do you um, get responses like from people who now maybe are thinking about West African food or food in America or food in certain places of America differently, um, you know, especially dishes like from Louisiana, in which, you know, sometimes, as you had mentioned in your book, you know, we don't talk about the, the past so much because it's so traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so curious, you know, what kinds of responses are you getting from folks who uh, either are hearing it, about it for the first time or might have been talking about food you know, cultural food ignorantly. I mean, I think the, the, the biggest thing I'm, the biggest thing that I'm hearing is that people are so interested that like of the stories of how these dishes originated, like the story of like jerk chicken, how it came 
it's a dish born of freedom of, of people escaping slavery and trying to hide their locations. So they dig pits and they put the coals and they put the chicken on top and they covered it so the smoke permeated it, but it also helped preserve it. And now it's still a, a, a staple, you know, it's a, it's a dish that everyone knows, jerk chicken. So, but people don't know these stories. And that's why um, I, I've been, it's just been overwhelmingly like positive um, and um, supportive of, of this piece of work, because it's like you said, it's not just a cookbook. It's talking about the origins of these dishes and giving, you know, a face to the faceless people that, that created it. And for yourself, learning more about your family and your past history, yeah. what was some of the things that came up for you that might have been surprising or shocking or, or actually hard to learn? Um, honestly, like, it was beautiful, like, because I, I spent time with, like, my, my loved ones, you know, I spent time with my grandfather in Trinidad, you know, and I, I walked I jumped over the canals he jumped over as a kid. You know, I went to his elementary school. I ate at the restaurants that he loved. I went to Mamu, Louisiana, you know, with my grandma and, you know, saw the hospital that she was born in because it was the only black, uh, it was the only hospital that took black patients in, in town. And it was all the way at the end of town. So like, I learned so much about my family that it was so culturally enriching. And, you know, more, the food was the easier part of this <laughs> because I just, I, I remember writing down a list of all the things I remember my mom cooking or like eating at my family's house. And I actually had to shave down. We had like 180 recipes. I had to shave it down. So I was like, damn, like I ate really good as a kid, you know, it showed me that, but it was really the stories of all these things and getting into it. That was, that was so beautiful. So at the end of the day, it just, it made me feel more whole um, than just cooking the food. Did your relationships change any, you know, and know that, again, like you shared a lot in your memoir, you shared a lot about the challenges and even, you know, the relationships, your, your family relationships, but after getting to know a whole lot more and especially through food, wondering if the relationships also changed. Yeah, they be, we, we all became closer. Um, you know, these, these, I call out things in this book, like my grandfather's um, sardines and, or my grandfather's like, white fish salad or my grandmother's zucchini bread you know it's like I'm able to like give them the credit that they deserve um that they may not have had and it's just because I just enjoyed their food you know growing up that I think everyone else should be able to have access to these recipes you say in the cookbook you say that gumbo is my first love and all my love in one pot what do you mean by that Oh man, gumbo just means so much to me. It, it was a dish that like my mom would make for like, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my mom could cook, you know? So like it would, what do you want to eat for your birthday? You know, what do you want for Christmas? What dish do you want? And oh, it was mostly gumbo, you know, gumbo and fisherman's pie, honestly, but gumbo was the thing that brought us together. Um, and it was like this, this act of love and kinship that like, you know, I would be chopping the onions, my sister would be like stirring the roux, my mom would be making the shrimp stock and then it all came together. So it's like all of my family in this like one beautiful pot of soup. Now I want gumbo, now <laughs> I want gumbo. <laughs> I want gumbo. Um, yeah, there's over 120, you know, 25 recipes I think in, mm -hmm. in this um, cookbook. And I'm wondering if, you left some out or if there are some recipes that you wish made the book that didn't? Yeah, I mean, I make these Brussels sprouts, these Suya Brussels sprouts uh, with like chili honey that are really great. Um, I do this um, Suya short rib that's like amazing. Um, so there were certain things that I just couldn't fit in there that also like it didn't weave in. I really wanted to, to tell the dishes of like my family. Um, so like that'll be in the next cookbook. That means there's another one coming up. My America recipes from a middle-aged Black chef. <laughs> middle age? I feel like you're just getting started, but obviously... My you're... next book, the next one. Yeah, you know, the next one. A while, a while. Yeah, how long did this, uh, you know, cookbook, how long did it take? Years. Two, Two years. years. Yeah, it takes yeah. time, you know, from the proposal, from like, then the, you know, we did the recipe testing while I was on Top Chef judging. So like they would ship these giant packages to me with like, all the different courses labeled and I would have after like judging an entire cooking show I'd have to then go and like eat 
12 different dishes. So it was a lot, but it was, it was fun. So while we're on the subject of judging food, I'm always curious. I mean, the shows are super entertaining. And I think the most entertaining part is obviously, you know, people like yourself who are in the shows, you're talented. But when it comes to like judging the dishes, like, what's that like? What do you like? Is it you're are you looking at it from so many different angles? Um, I mean, it really just comes down to is this food good? You know, um, yeah, I try to break down the cooking techniques if things are like seared properly or if they cook something, is it at the right temperature? But honestly, it, it has to taste good. That's the most important thing. And it should be hot, you know, when it's supposed to be. So so those, those are the things I really look for in presentation, the, the normal stuff. But for me, it's like, does this is this delicious? Yes or no? If it's not, then you're probably going home. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, something about this, because I find like when I don't know too much about food, right, and I'm trying it for the first time, it's a different experience when I know where the food came from, who made the food, and I know um, their stories. And so I'm wondering if you get responses from folks, you know, who feel completely different like do you feel like when you know food you know what's behind it the history behind it that that changes your palate I think it, it makes you more informed you know I think food has to taste good at the end of the day but like knowing the story behind it I think is important um I don't think everybody needs to know that but like for me it's just super interesting to know how a dish came to be you know to know why this certain ingredient is here because there's always a story behind that. And when a dish tells a story, it has a soul. You know, you're not just cooking for perfect seasoning. You're cooking to like share an experience with someone. Yeah. In America, you know, it's, it's, um, I think when I talk about food, I sometimes trip up with trying not to always talk about food as if it's, it's, uh, something you take for granted because I know, you know, so many people, their experiences, their migration, uh, the exploitation of, you know, their, their selves or bodies, you know, this is all part of America's history and culture. So specifically talking about, you know, America and food, and how do you, do you think that would become way more responsible? Um, and that we should be like when we're, we're thinking about food and that it's not just right. This thing that shows up at the table. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple of ways to look at it, you know, like there's, first of all, there's so much food insecurity in, in America as is. So like respecting the ingredients and like not wasting food, I think is something that all human beings should do. Um, but also like the price of food, you know, I don't, I don't think we charge enough for it, like, especially like in restaurants, because people complain about, you know, a restaurant isn't, um, you know, they don't, give a workable or a living wage and you know that's a, a big reason because they're not able to add on like what a clothing company can add for a, a shirt that costs them 50 cents to make you know you, they can charge whatever they want <laughs> but in a restaurant you can't really do that so um so yeah i think being more responsible with food food is life you know food is it's, it's the only art form we ingest but it's also what keeps us alive so knowing more about that in all different aspects are, are really, really important and integral to the fabric of humanity. We already have some questions coming in from the audience. So thank you so much for sending them. And if you have more, keep them coming. Um, I'll start with one here. What would your cheat day meal be? <laughs> oh, man. I, I love chicken wings and pork fried rice from Chinese takeout spot. That's like my cheat, cheat meal day. But every day is a cheat meal to me. I eat whatever I want. <laughs> um I, you know I wasn't sure if I wanted to get into this with you but uh it's just talking about yeah being close but this audience member's question which is what is the biggest challenge facing the restaurant industry today mm, taxes and rent the tax is way too high <laughs> and the rent is way too high um, those are the biggest things I think that are like troubling the, the restaurant industry. How do you see American cuisine evolving? Ooh, um, American cuisine evolving. 
I think it's going to evolve with, with, with the times, you know, as I think new trends come out, you know, new, new different um, cultures are, you know, put on a pedestal. I think, I think all of those things have to do with, with the way that America's food, food ways will change because, you know, America is directly reflected by its people. So the people here, you know, the, the different, the more diverse, the more diverse we eat, you know, and that will change the scope of, of how food is. And add to that question, I think that, you know, we're talking a lot more about race today than uh, I guess, maybe because, you know, there's social media and whatnot. So it feels like a lot more people are paying attention to it. Um, I think it's directly, you know, connected to food or food culture uh, and, and also it's possible evolution. What do you think, you know, having these discussions around food and then being able to maybe going, going back to that question of like being socially responsible, but particularly about race, you have done it with this, this cookbook, in my opinion, I think you will open up a lot of eyes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I hope, you know, I hope people just see, um, see that like we're so much similar than we are different, you know, every, every nationality has their own rice dish or their meat on a stick or their soup, you know, and it just looks different with the ingredients that are there and then the tradition. So, um, you know, this is a book to hopefully open people up. Yeah, um, I'll be honest with you. And when I think about like fishermen, I, for, I, I'm sure of it, it's all part of, right? Like what is wrong with our systems? But I had always thought about like white fishermen. I'd never pictured like a black fisherman. And you talk a whole lot about, um, right? Like seafood, black fishermen and, and their history in America and how rich their history is in America. Um, yeah, the, let's dive into that. Let's talk about the contributions of the Black community to American food, the African contributions. Yeah, um, well, definitely down in Louisiana, you know, most of the shrimpers are, are, are African American, you know, they're Black. Um, and it's, uh, it's a way to provide for your family. You know, any any type of hard labor <laughs> you can think of or, or thing that like really is the is the foundation of our nation someone of color had that job you know way before anyone else so um so it's important to like really think of that and respect that and give those give that some attention um i don't think it, it's going to change anything because that's also that's their trade you know and that's what they also love doing but you know that they're responsible for a lot of the food that that's on our table uh, do you think that, I mean, in, in your experience, at least, and the amount of success that you have seen already, and so, so many people want to talk to you, um, not just about food, but about you and your thoughts, uh, but is it is it ever surprising when you realize that a lot of people don't know, like, food history and contributions of, like, folks of color in, in this country? Not really. A lot of people don't know a lot about it, a lot of things. So it's not it, it's not surprising to me. And it's also like it's someone's prerogative if they want to do the the research or or reading up on something to have that information. Um, it I think it's more surprising to me when people are just like ignorant to to the fact that these things have happened or they don't care at all or it, it just doesn't even cross their mind, but not having the knowledge isn't that surprising to me. We have another audience question here. Can you share what was your biggest kitchen mishap? My biggest kitchen mishap? Oh man, I, I was like, uh, wow, that was a long time ago. I was catering a movie set and I had to cook for the crew every day. I was like their craft services and, um, I made this big pot of like chicken Alfredo and I was taking it over to the table and I dropped it like right before I got there. And then as soon as I dropped it, it was like, and cut. All right, everybody head to lunch. And I was like, oh my God. And like, I made something in 10 minutes. I don't remember what I made. It was like, it was craziness. Whatever I made was, was ridiculous. But I just remember being so nervous um, doing that. So that was probably one of my biggest kitchen mishaps. What about some of the um, dishes that maybe have evolved uh, with leading up to this cookbook? Is there a recipe of yours that has changed over time? 
Um, yeah, all of my recipes, honestly, when I, every time I make them, I try to make it a little bit better. Um, especially like when you're in the restaurant and doing it constantly, constantly, constantly. So like the, you know, the curried goat has changed a couple of times. Um, the oxtails has gotten like different marinades and spices put on it. Um, the, um, the, the jerk chicken, you know, that recipe is like super involved. You know, you start by making a jerk chicken brine and brining the chicken and then making a marinade and marinating it for a couple of days and then smoking it in pimento wood as well as seasoning it with pimento. So there's a couple of dishes in there that like I'm really proud of because like the version now as a version like back then are like are two totally different things. And what about like, you know, getting all the uh, spices? So say, for example, you're, this is your first journey down the road of different, you know, ingredients that you've never used before. Um, what could you say about like, you know, venturing out into a new place to be looking for these things and what to be mindful of that, you know, you're not running around at some store, um, mm -hmm. you know, trying to be an expert all of a sudden. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of these can be found online. Um, and I don't think any of these are like super obscure. There may be a couple things in there that like people may have never heard of, but um, but yeah, be open. You know, it's I tell people this all the time. And they're like, oh my God, I'm so like nervous to like cook these recipes. Like, is it going to be good? I'm like, you're not on the operating table. <laughs> this is, it's just dinner. So have some fun with it. If you can't find one pepper, replace it with another. You know, it's, it's just a guideline. That's what a recipe is at the end of the day because you're eating it. So make sure you're making it for yourself. We have another question here from the audience and um, no surprise here. We all want to, we all want to ask you a bunch of questions. Um, can you talk more about your partnership with Orly and the organizations that the proceeds support? Yeah, so, um, you know, I have this uh, nail polish line with Orly and the proceeds go to a nonprofit organization called uh, Bigs and Littles. It's a mentorship program in New York City that uh, mentors, you know, kids in the inner city that don't really have, um, you know, positive figures in their life or, you know, guardians at, at all times. Um, and they have 100% higher education success rate higher education success rate. So it's something that I think is super important is mentorship, especially in the inner city. Um, that's something that's not really there. So being able to support an organization like this is, is, is really important to me. Near the end of the cookbook, you do mention that, you know, you're prepping, you're getting ready to move to Los Angeles. I imagine you're already in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, but moving from New York city, I mean, so much of the recipes in the book are, from your experiences growing up in the Bronx and all that stuff. And so I just, I was just wondering, you know, was it hard to leave? Uh, have you found, you know- no, I love, I love LA. LA, yeah. is great. <laughs> LA is great. It's, it's 70 degrees every single day. It never rains. Um, and there's so much more space. Uh, so yeah, I, I love LA. How's the uh, food scene, you know, has it changed anything for you? Um, food, scene, food scene in LA is great. You know, Mexican food and tacos are prevalent and everywhere. Um, there's so many different pockets, whether it's like Thai town or, you know, little Tokyo. Um, there's so many different pockets of, of all these different cultures that, that have amazing food. So I love LA. Yeah. Yeah. Birria is a huge thing, right? Right now between yeah. even Southern California, <laughs> Northern California. Everywhere. How would you, uh, would you do birria differently or, you know, what's your birria uh, recipe? Yeah. I would do a classic. I mean, I've had birria in Guadalajara, you know, like, and, and it's, it's great just as it is. Uh, I love it. But it's, there's this huge boom. Everyone's doing, it. everyone's doing their own take on it. And it's, I, I don't even think I've had it here. I've only had it in Mexico. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I haven't met, you know, birria taco that wasn't one that I would take home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love BDO. Um, we got another comment question here from the audience. Okay. Sheesh, you've achieved so much at a pretty young age. One, what's the story behind your youth? Was it always food for you? When did you decide that food is the career you wanted to pursue? And um, I'll ask the second one after you answer this one. Yeah, I mean, I started cooking at five years old. My mom had a catering company that she operated um, 
from the house and she very much against the law threw me an apron at five years old and I had to help out. So food, you know, it started off as a chore, which became a passion and then, you know, became a career. So it's always been around me. And uh, who was the influence in your life? I guess, you, yes, you mentioned your mom, um, but maybe some mm-hmm. others that you got interested in food that maybe still try to impress with your cooking? <laughs> no, yeah. my mom, my mom's my inspiration. She's my biggest inspiration. She's my hero. Um, so that's the person that really inspired me to cook. Yeah, this cookbook is dedicated to her. Mm-hmm. And you had talked a, a lot about, you know, the, your relationship, right, with your mom. Um, so how does she feel about this cookbook? Oh, she loves it. Um, she's very, very, um, she's very, very proud of me for being able to put something out like that and kind of preserve our family's like legacy. Got another question for you. How, uh, let's see here. I think we talked about it. What are your interests outside of cooking? Is there something out there that could steal you away from the food world? I like acting a lot. I've been, I started acting recently. Um, I actually filmed my first movie that's coming out in, um, in the summertime on Amazon. It's called um, Sugar. So like acting is the thing that I, that I really, really love. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you're, you're right there. We can't wait to see it. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, what's the one ingredient or dish that you think everyone needs to try uh, or try with an open mind or make in their lifetime? Uh, a goosey soup that's in the book. Um, it's this like, you know, uh, this like leafy sauce, you know, thickened with um, melon seeds and a crayfish powder. And it's usually like served with like goat or beef or chicken. And you eat it with pounded yam, fufu, which is like this, um, this starchy yam that, that we put in like a giant mortar and pestle um, until it is, you know, it has a little give to it. And you break that off, you can dip it in the stew and eat it. It's phenomenal. Let's talk about vegetables. I feel like more people are trying to be uh, creative with vegetables and maybe doing more of a plant-based diet. And what's your favorite vegetable and what would you make with it? My favorite vegetable is chicken. No, no, no. My favorite vegetable would probably probably be mushrooms. Mushrooms. Um, I don't know if that counts as a vegetable, but yeah, I mean, I, I just love seared mushrooms, you know, seared with some butter and some thyme, garlic, lots of salt. That's what, what more do you need? Yeah, I thought you might say okra, but yeah, no, that's not my favorite vegetable. No, yeah, but okra, you have a couple okra uh, recipes mm-hmm. in here that yeah, I would like love to try. Yeah, I love okra, but it's not my favorite. favorite yeah, recipe. yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned, I'm, well, I talked about it in the very beginning. We talked about the different places that you went back to revisit and visit as part of uh, research for this cookbook. And it was because you're telling your stories, but um, maybe some new relationships of yours that are developing that if you were thinking about new recipes in, as a middle-aged man, I mean, what other places would you go? Um, I'd probably go to like Senegal. I'd go to Ethiopia. Um, I would go back to Thailand, um, India, you know, I love India. I think I would, yeah, I would love to go to those places, but I think if I did another cookbook, it would just be like my guilty pleasure foods. It would be like a fun cookbook. You know, I would say like my last two books were like serious, very informative. This one would be like chicken wings and pork fried rice. This is how I make mine. You know, it'd be stuff like that. I was going to ask, okay, other than the pork fried rice and some chicken wings, you know, what, what are some additions to that is I mean it's bad right like for me like I, my guilty pleasure is packaged ramen oh that's good too but um halal cart like chicken and lamb over rice um from the halal carts of New York City uh, uh chili cheese dog from Ben's Chili Bowl in DC um you know jerk chicken I, I love all those things and I eat them all the time um, some more questions coming in from our audience here. How has the pandemic affected you personally? Preparing and enjoying food is such a social experience. Have you found that COVID has changed the way you're able to share your craft? Um, it, it, no, not really. You know, I'm able to, I'm able to cook. The world's back open again. Um, I think it, it was different during the pandemic for sure. But now that we're back, you know, we're back, baby. 
we're outside. Yeah. What's the best piece of advice that you've, you've received and who is it from and what advice would you like to pass on to young, inspiring chefs? Best piece of advice I've received is to go into every single failure with the same enthusiasm, meaning like never give up. Like you never know what's going to be successful and that's what successful people do. Um, and I would give the same advice to a young chef. Uh, we touched on this, but it's a question from the audience. So I want to respect that, but you know, the different food culture from the East coast to the West coast. The different food culture from the East coast to the West coast. I mean, the West coast has amazing ingredients. You know, their growing season is like year round. So the, the access to such great produce is, is like what I really equate with the West coast. And I think the East coast is just like, one, there's like lots of walkable foods, like hot dogs and, and a slice of pizza. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, they're 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 both different. They both have different people there, um, and different different influences in the culture. I mean, we talked about a possible, you know, second cookbook, but um, again, you know, I'm I'm just so fascinated and also appreciate the fact that you put yourself out there with the first memoir. Um, do you have any thoughts about, you know, uh, additional follow-up to that first memoir and you know, what experiences would you include if you were I would, doing I would need some time. I would need some time. The first memoir was, you know, 25 years of my life. So I would have to wait, you know, for another 25, probably before I wrote another one, but it would be about, I don't know, who knows, probably my experience of doing like multiple things, you know, not just in the food world, you know, opening businesses you know, um, being a media personality, um, still opening restaurants, acting, like all of those different things is probably what I would cover. Yeah, I find that so many people always want to keep talking about the fact that you overcame your challenges, um, especially around the, you know, selling drugs. And you know, how do you go from selling drugs to opening up a bunch of restaurants uh, all under, you know, 30? All so that, yeah, <laughs> what's that? It's all a hustle. It's all a hustle. Selling drugs, selling plates, the same thing. But also, I think drug dealers are like, they're very efficient business, <laughs> business people. And, you know, a law one day can say you can do one thing and can't do the other. So, you know, look at weed, for example, like America is capitalizing off of this cash crop that they were imprisoning people for, you know, nonviolent crimes for very long periods of time. And now it's legal. So it, it, I wouldn't change anything that was part of my journey. Like it, it all helped me be the person that I am right now. Couple more questions here. Um, who is impressing you these days locally? And where do you look forward to eating? Um, I haven't really had my finger on the pulse, to be honest. Um, you know, I... I have my favorite restaurants that I just go to all the time. <laughs> you know, like I have this restaurant called We Jammin. It's a Jamaican spot in, in LA. I have a place called Fish Cheeks, a Thai spot in New York City. Um, you know, there's a spot called Share Share. It's an Ethiopian restaurant in Washington, DC. So I have like my restaurants that I go to that I'm excited about. But, you know, there, there are some young chefs. Like I have this event called the Family Reunion that I do. It's like a four-day food festival that celebrates Black contributions to the food industry. Um, it's with, it's with Food and Wine magazine. And I get like a lot of like up-and-coming chefs and like a lot of chefs like that are just like legends as well. You know, so, you know, I love Tiffany Derry's food. I love, you know, Rodney Scott's food. I love Gregory Gourdet's food. Um, and then there's some like new people like Charlie Mitchell out in Brooklyn. There's Martel Stone in Washington, D.C., so there's a lot of people doing doing some fun stuff around the country. Now you mentioned before you don't want to be known as a celebrity chef, but I mean you are a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> you are a chef. You are these things. Um, I also think like food media is changing, and part of that change is because of some of the folks that you mentioned. They're just you know new talent or talent uh, really their story is being told. Would you agree? Do you think that, right, like, like food and TV and, and certain chefs and their stories being told is um, evolving? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think there's, there's this, um, 
fetishization of chefs and their stories um that's been happening for a while honestly but but definitely as of recent you know it's been it's been a thing you know people want to be friends with chefs people want to know what they're up to they 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 um romanticize the kitchen and everything like that um so yeah it's only going to continue and i think it's good i think people i think it's good that you're getting looked at as also more than chefs like you can do more you can also speak up for things that you really, really believe in. Here's a question from an audience member. Can you talk about running your own kitchen? What did you learn along the way and what makes a good leader in the kitchen? I think a good leader in the kitchen is someone who knows how to talk to people. You know, a, a chef, the, the word literally means boss or leader, you know? Um, so I think, uh, you got to know how, how to talk to different people because everyone is different. And also people come in with different baggage every single day. So you got to understand like how to really get through to someone and leading by example is, is super important as well. Like not asking people to do stuff that you would not do or you've never done before. Um, so I've learned to like lead with grace. That's something that's been really, really important to me. Like, you know, violence begets violence. So like yelling and screaming is not really the way to go. Um, so yeah, I've learned I've learned so many different things, but like just being being a leader is the thing that like I really took away. I, was, I have a lot of friends, obviously, in the um, restaurant business, and they had once, you know, talked about how racist, sexist, homophobic the kitchen can be. Um, do you think that that is changing as well? Because again, like you know, we have more people who are emerging as talent and in the positions to make decisions. And opening restaurants like yourself, you know, your young leaders. I think there's more awareness to it. You know, I don't know if it's changing everywhere. I'm not in every kitchen, but I think there's more awareness to it. So you can't get away with certain things that you used to. Um, and I think that that's what really needs to change in the industry is, is how people are treated, um, how people are compensated. Um, but yeah, things, things are changing because we're talking about it right now and people used to never talk about those things. So it's getting better, but, you know, it has a it still has a long way to go because even if it's just a little better it doesn't mean that that's like where it needs to be. So the San Francisco Chronicle and you open up you know the the book. There's a uh, a thing here that says that you are the most important chef in America. I agree, <laughs> and I have my reasons why I think you are. But I'd love to hear you know how that resonates with you. How how do you feel about it? I mean, that's a that's a heavy, heavy crown. Um, you know, I was very humbled hearing that. Um, it's not something I put on myself. So but it, it's um, I think we all all of us that have a platform should be using our voice for something, you know, uh, to advocate for something and everything we do should be done with intentionality. Um, there should be some th philanthropic arm to whatever it is that we're doing. Um, it shouldn't just be about capitalism and gimme, gimme, gimme. It should be about taking care of our brothers and sisters, you know, around the country and world. A few more questions here while we have time. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and ask them for our audience here. Could you tell us about being a judge on a TV cooking reality show? I know I asked you that, but is the food that we're seeing being prepared really, really good when you taste it on the show? Uh, are you frequently impressed when judging TV shows? Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. <laughs> And sometimes I'm impressed and sometimes I'm confused. So it's um, it's a little bit of both. It, it's really fun, though. But the food, you know, the time that they're cooking, that that's the real time that they have to make it. You know, our reactions are real. Nothing is scripted. It's um, it's a real competition um, and it's tough. Take it from me. I was there on the other side of that table. Um, I'm glad I'm on this side of the table now, but it was it was tough. Are you even able to focus on being, you know, the chef, like when you're in these like cooking shows or are there other things going on uh, through your mind? Like I could imagine being like, oh, do I look good on camera? How do I sound? And all of a sudden I'm not really focused on my dish. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. There's a lot going through your mind. You have cameras in your face. You have producers asking you questions. You have a, a clock that is continuously going down and the time seems like it's going twice as fast um but you know you got to dig deep and you got to get creative and you got to trust your instinct and your intuition 
and you know try to remind yourself that all the things that made you who you are is the reason why you're here so just cook your food and you know cook with soul i think about some of the most successful chefs on tv and you know um like sometimes people gravitate towards the american dad or the the barbecue dad um, you know kind of a chef on um on tv but what do you think makes a successful chef on tv because i think they're it's a little different than say just saying i'm a successful chef i think you have to know really know how to cook i think that's like really really important to be a successful chef on tv um because it's just as nuanced you know you need to know exactly what you're talking about you need to be able to do what you're like judging people on um so i think those things are like incredibly important is like actually having um actually like having your craft like honed you know having worked on that first before you then get on tv because i see you know you see a lot of chefs that are on tv and not on tv you know in and out flash in the pan and i think like really focusing on your craft is like the most important thing and then that's just an extension of you uh another good question here besides family members did you have mentors in the food restaurant industry what did you learn from them I didn't really have many mentors in the in the industry. I mean, I had some mentors uh, in the like in culinary school, like Bruce Mattel, um, but it was like more of like a sounding board, you know, going to them and like talking to them about my options and 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 uh, you know, like what do I what do, what what path should I take, you know? Um, but I didn't really have any mentors that were like literally like next to me with a knife, you know, showing me things like that that were there. Besides my mom, my mom is my mentor. Uh, a couple questions here. I'll just kind of summarize them. Uh, I know that you've touched on it before, but is there a dish from another chef that you wish you came up with? Mm. Yeah, the cheeseburger. I'd be a, I'd be a trillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this to myself many times. I'm with you, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. I know that we had talked about you, you know, in some other places that you would want to travel to, but this particular question, is there a country you'd like to visit, you know, such as Cuba, Japan, maybe the Middle East somewhere? I would love to go to the Middle East, honestly. I mean, I think the food over there is so amazing and like deeply rooted in history. So I would love to go there and understand their food ways. Uh, uh, let's see here. And, uh, do you want to, um, actually, I want to go back to uh, your book. Um, you write that, you know, the book is an exploration of the past of individual lifetimes and societal lifelines told through recipes. Um, I love what you had to say about that. Cause I think that, you know, food can bring people together. Uh, but yeah, elaborate on what you mean by it. I mean, the book just like really, it's not a book that's like Notes from Young Black Chef was like all about me and my story. This is about the people that like kind of made me who I am. So like all the different cultures that I come from, whether it's like Trinidad, Jamaica, you know, Nigeria or Louisiana, like all of those, all of those are connected, especially because of the slave trade, you know, but, um, but also telling the stories of these dishes and how they came to be was so important for me. So that's what I mean by that, you know, that just like the whole landscape and it, we're all connected and here's how we're connected and here's, you know, this beautiful cuisine. Um, you also, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about beans and it's all beans. obviously, <laughs> it's included in here. I th- I feel like sometimes, you know, regular people like myself get lost, like with what we can do with it, but this cookbook has so many recipes and really good recipes of what you can do with beans. Um, so if you can share maybe one that you think those who are listening and, and listening to you right now that you should try doing something different with beans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, red beans and rice. It's a quintessential like Louisiana dish of like red kidney beans, like stewed down with the Holy Trinity and like Creole spice and lots of thyme and bay leaf and and sausage, um, and it's it, it all comes together like in this it, this beautiful like velvety um, bean dish, and then you have the chunks of the smoky sausage in there. You eat it on white rice, and there's like nothing like it. You just add some Louisiana hot sauce, and you got yourself a great night. 
I have a question here. At such a young age, you opened multiple restaurants, cooked for well-known celebrities, and was a contestant judge on cooking shows. Was there a moment that you felt that you that you made it, like this is this is it, and that you're most proud of? I never feel like I've made it, you know. I think that that's the beautiful thing, just continuing to push and push and push and push. And there's been holy shit moments, like, you know, winning the James Beard Award, you know, cooking cooking at the White House. There's been stuff like that. But um, but it's always like every day, like when I get up the next day, I was like, okay, how can I be better today? Like, what else can I do? You know, and that's what really keeps me going is that not thinking I made it. Because once you think you yeah. made it, yeah, and you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you've got a, you got a movie coming out, um, so you keep pushing it, um, but I mean, of course, I'm with everybody who's tuning in right now, and I had known it, but just to be impressed by, by you, and being yourself, like, you know, you just share so much of your authenticity, um, do you find that that's rare in your industry, or not really, and like, most people are you know, just being themselves. Most chefs are. Most. I don't know. I don't try to like concern myself like with having opinions on others. You know, I focus on like what I'm doing and take care of my family. Um, so like, I would hope everybody is authentic. You know, but that's that's their own prerogative, and that's the life that they have to live. I don't have to live that life. So. Yeah, you mentioned the White House, so we got a question here. Can you talk about what cooking at the White House was like? It was cool. It was for the Easter egg roll. So um, I got to cook. I brought my niece as like my sous chef and, and you know, she helped out. Um, but it was really, really great. It was this, it happens every year, the Easter egg roll, um, where they traditionally like roll the eggs down the hill. Um, so it was great. It was fun. I had a blast. I got to like sit and talk with, you know, Obama and Michelle. It was the first time I've ever been starstruck. I had nothing to say. So it was really, really cool. I was going to ask, like, I mean, because I you had mentioned it before, you know, President Obama being elected as the first African-American president was kind of, you know, it was a pivotal moment for you uh, in your life, at least, you know, recognizing where you, you wanted to go with your own life. And so meeting him, you were speechless, but at the same time, did that, that you know, sit with you? Did it finally resonate or, you know, kind of hit you that I'm really doing this? I mean, I was filled with gratitude, honestly. I was like, this, yeah, for sure. It was like, wow, this is, I think, you know, there are certain celebrities that you meet, you're like, oh my God, you see their photos everywhere. You know, like Obama is like this like mythical creature <laughs> and seeing him in real life, it was, it was very surreal, very surreal. I thought he was floating for real. <laughs> Okay, um, there's an audience question here who says that I heard you have a Harry Potter tattoo. Is that true? And if you do, uh, what is your your house and why? I have the Deathly Hallows tattoo. <laughs> Obviously, I'm Harry Potter. I'm a Gryffindor. Come on now. You could have guessed that. What, what would you be? Me? Would you be in? Yeah. Oh, oh I, or the audience or the person who asked the question. Um, I'm not a Harry Potter fan. That means you'll be Hufflepuff. <laughs> oh, I'm going to, you know, go back. We have, we have like seven minutes left and I know you've got a really important event to go to. So I'm going to come back to your cookbook, My America, Recipes from a Young Black Chef. Um, I, I, one of the, uh, I guess, a journalist that I had read when I was doing some reading about you had talked about you sharing these recipes as a young black chef in it in itself is incredibly important um you know what are you why do you think that is um it's important for everyone to tell their story it's important to just be authentic you know i think giving giving this food a platform is is special you know i haven't really seen many cookbooks with like traditional just jamaican oxtails or jerk chicken or curried goat you know as is so for me, it's like really, really beautiful to be able to put that on a page, you know, and see the food also photographed beautifully. Um, so, so yeah, it means a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. As for me, I think, you know, somebody who lives in downtown Oakland, somebody who consumes, you know, American things, uh, your book is so important for me to, to be more authentic about people's contributions in our society 
-hmm. then to walk into some of these restaurants and know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't just sit down and mispronounce a dish or think that it's just tasty, Mm -hmm. but that I know the background behind it. So thank you so much for the book. Um, if, if, you know, somebody was opening this book for the very first time and they want to try out a recipe, do you have recommendations on maybe a couple yeah. that you start out with? Definitely the jerk chicken. It, it, it takes a couple of days to make, but it's like, it's, it's a, it's a very, very great and solid recipe that, you know, has so much flavor. Um, and yeah, I would, I would encourage everyone to at least make that recipe. What's the one spice you can't live without? The spice of life. Um, the one spice I can't live without would be um, house spice. It's my mom's spice blend. It has like, you know, granulated garlic and onion and, you know, um, salt and uh, cayenne and paprika and like Worcestershire powder. And it's like really, really great. And that's in the book, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. It's in the book. It's in the pantry. It's in the pantry. Do you think your mom has any other recipes she hasn't shared with you yet? No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's no more tricks up her sleeve. She's I've been around her too long. <laughs> <laughs> but she's still cooking, so she's still like creating new things, you know. So she, she definitely like she's a chef. So she's she's got some stuff up there that she may not have made yet. But everything that she has made, like I've I've tasted. What about dishes that you are teaching her? I mean, most dishes that I'm making are like adaptations of hers. So it's just like teaching her a different way to look at the food that she's already making. Um, So yeah, I've I've taught her a couple of things, you know, like my cucumber avocado salad to name, to name a few. Um, But yeah, we always, we always work together, you know, and, and, um, and try to just help each other put out the best menu possible. Yeah. So last question, it's a, maybe a funny last question. I think it's from the same person who asked about your Harry Potter tattoo. Mm-hmm. So if you were going to cook a meal for Harry Potter um, and mm. it's, your, it's your signature dish just for him, what would it be? It would be Horcrux stew. <laughs> and they'll get that. Uh, see, I'm so like lost. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'll make him the best treacle tart he's ever had in his entire life. <laughs> um, Chef, it's been super awesome chatting with you. And thank you so much for this cookbook. I mean, it's something I'm going to pass on to uh-huh. my kids or whoever inherits whatever I have. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been fun. Everyone, we encourage all of you to pick up a copy of uh, Chef's new cookbook, My America, at your local bookstore. If you would like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org. I'm Michelle Miao. We'll see you next time.